Our scripture today in our bulletin starts at 31. I'm going to take us back to 27 and give us a little backstory. This is from the Gospel of Mark, starting with chapter 8. Now, I will also say that I preached on this text at our presbytery meeting yesterday, and our uh, new softball lead, uh, Norma McNair, was there. <laughs> Actually, we were in a different sanctuary, but you were sitting in the same spot, funny enough. We are creatures of habit, aren't we? Uh, so I did preach on this yesterday at our presbytery meeting. It's tradition for the outgoing moderator to preach at the presbytery meeting. And so, yes, praise the Lord, I did rotate off as moderator. I know the year flew by for you and for me. And uh, we installed our, our, new, our new moderator. But just so you know, Norma, I did change it a little bit for us, so you're not hearing the exact same sermon twice. I made it contextual to BPC. So here is a little bit of the backstory. This is Mark chapter 8, starting at 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. At least that's how I hear it. That's the voice that I hear him. He was eager. He wanted to be the first one to say it. But Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Okay. Okay. And then we pick up with our text at 31 here. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside. Remember the guy who just said, you are the Messiah. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy ghosts. Oh, holy angels. <laughs> Not holy ghosts, that's different. <laughs> but holy angels. Whew, I'm exhausted. Y'all, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What a doozy. Well, many of you might know that the phrase, not today, Satan, is very popular to see on t-shirts and internet memes. I've seen it cross-stitched on pillows and wall decor. Just the other day, I was scrolling through some social media thing, and a friend of mine had her cat right next to her pillow, beautifully cross-stitched, not today, Satan. It was a lovely picture. I've seen this phrase on Etsy art, and it's screen printed next to images of 1950s housewives. Friends love to send me things with this phrase, because frankly, we all get a kick out of it. It's generally used as a way of saying, I'm not going to take any no, no, nonsense from anybody, right? Not today, Satan. One thing, though, that I love about the popularity of this in pop culture sphere is that like so many popular expressions and phrases, 
it originated from none other than RuPaul's Drag Race. Yes, it did. I tell you, that is a magical and influential program. <laughs> really shaping our culture and society. Apparently, it was first uttered by Bianca Del Rio in the final episode of the sixth season of RuPaul's Drag Race in 2014, which she won. So this is also, of course, according to the internet, which I have quoted many a time as fact. So take that for what you will. So although this phrase, not today, Satan, is not exactly like the phrase from our text today, get behind me, Satan, I mean, it's pretty similar. And the drama in this scene is juicy, worthy of a reality show. So right before this text begins, Peter has just declared Jesus the Messiah, and Jesus is like, first of all, don't tell anybody, and second of all, here's this bummer teaching about suffering and death, and now I can just see the disciples all being like, oh no, like, the awkwardness and the discomfort as they're all listening to Jesus. Like, oh God, did he say a cross? I mean, do we have to? Was that really a part of what we signed up for? We had a very different idea on how this was going to unfold. And so as I did my research on this text, reading commentaries, listening to podcasts, doing the thing, I heard a couple of really appealing perspectives on this phrase, get behind me, Satan. And I'm going to share it with you all today. So a few appealing things about this phrase. The first one is that Jesus is rebuking Peter, not because Peter himself necessarily is full of nonsense, but also this is a very real temptation for Jesus. The Gospel of Mark does not have the drawn-out wilderness temptation stories that the other Gospels have, and there is no rebuke of Satan in the wilderness in Mark's Gospel, like it's told in the other Gospels. So instead, we have it here, in this confrontation with Peter. Essentially, Peter is presenting the messianic vision of power, wealth, status, and dominion that Jesus has to reject in order to really bring about God's purposes on earth. In calling out Peter, he's really calling out the very real temptation to go after what the world says is valuable and what society says is powerful, what the people were all expecting a Messiah to be and to look like and to act like, not what God says is valuable. Different things. A second perspective that I really dug was the suggestion that the phrase, get behind me, was not so much like, be gone with you, away with you, get out of here kind of thing, but a get behind me, get in line with my vision, come on board with what God has in store for us. Like, yeah, it might not be power and might. In fact, it's going to be the opposite of that. And be really hard. But trust me. Trust me. Follow my way. Get behind me. It's the way to life. It's the only way to really live your life. Now, this news about suffering, rejection, and death definitely came as a shock and a bummer to his disciples, and the crowd gathered. It was not what they had in mind with a messianic arrival, and it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to process, and in fact, theologians have tried to figure this out for like 2,000 years. What does it mean that Jesus says this? that Jesus did this. What does it mean? And the most powerful part of the text actually gets easily skimmed over. Yes, 
We worship a God of suffering, of rejection, of death. But even still, even in this crazy announcement that Jesus is making, that his disciples and the gathered crowd, it's still there. And after three days, rise again. Like I said, it kind of gets buried because there's a lot of other stuff in there, but nonetheless, resurrection. There it is. And you can't have resurrection without death. Yes, sometimes death is scary and sad and tragic. And yes, sometimes death is untimely and unjust and unwarranted. But still, we worship a God of death and resurrection, of restoration, of revitalization, of regeneration. As a church, we are very afraid of death. We are afraid of that other bad D word, decline. Ugh. We are afraid of becoming obsolete or, frankly, losing our power, losing our status. Especially mm, wealthy, predominantly white churches like ours. We remember the days of yore when more people went to church and the pews were packed and going to church was much more prevalent part of society. I grew up in church in the 80s and 90s. I remember I was there. If I had a dollar for every time we use the phrase, well, we used to, or back in the 90s, I'd have a lot of dollars, many of them. We speak about that past like we're rehashing the glory days. But I'm just going to say, I think that there is a blatant idolatry in our churches around the days of yore. We idolize the days when more people were in church and pine for the past as if it was golden without any problems. And the present just doesn't measure up and in fact, the younger generations get dismissed as lazy, overly sensitive, and materialistic. And as an elder millennial, I take offense to that. However, if I'm being real with you, I have no interest in going back to a church that didn't support women, that didn't support LGBTQ equality, that wasn't getting real about systemic racism. No thank you. Hard pass. But we are not special in this fear of a declining church. We're just not. It's the reality for so many churches around our country. It's a very real issue going on. There are articles and books being written about it. There are workshops about it. What do we do? We have these old aging buildings. And how do we navigate this new territory for us? Considering that this decline is already happening, and it's been happening for years, considering there are so many people, frankly, who are turned off by church, who are distrustful of the followers of Jesus, people like us, I mean, how many people run away when you mention that you're a Christian, or at the very least, give you some side eye? How many of us here gathered or watching online are sad and hurt that friends and family aren't interested in joining us here no matter how many times we invite them or we say no BPC is different there is rampant well-deserved skepticism of our broken systems and really terrible PR I mean, I didn't love it hearing that the Chief Justice from Alabama was invoking the wrath of God this week. Ugh. And I don't know about you, did y'all like those Super Bowl ads that said Jesus gets us? Maybe some people did, and I heard kind of mixed reviews, but 
I don't know. I just think that we are so afraid of the church dying that we can't see straight. The fear messes with our priorities and causes us to confuse God's values with our values. Maybe, like Peter, we think that the Christ is supposed to have power and wealth and political status, and therefore our churches should too. When in reality, what Jesus is saying is the opposite of that. The revelation of God in the world is actually in weakness, in suffering, and in death. We'd much rather have power and status. I'll speak for myself. I would much rather have power and status. We'd much rather have a church that matches what society says is successful, these standards that we set for ourselves on what success looks like. But Jesus says, actually, to get behind him is completely contradictory to that. It's neither glamorous nor pretty. It's not based on success or influence or membership numbers or big budgets. If God comes to us in the form of Christ crucified, that means that to know God is to know suffering, rejection, and death, and resurrection. That means that the death of the modern Christendom in the form of our declining churches well, it actually mirrors the gospel that God is present with the weak and the struggling and the dying. Those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for the sake of the gospel will save it. You can't have resurrection without death. It is hard work to recognize privilege, to fix broken systems, to promote justice for the oppressed. Death is inevitable. If we want to be reborn, if we want restoration, revitalization, regeneration in the world, it's not going to be through church models of days gone by. It requires death. The old life is gone. A new life is emerges, says the Apostle Paul. That's not to say that there isn't grief or sadness at the death of the church as we know it, but it does mean that God is with us, for us, that God is at work constantly to bring about a new thing, that God is bringing us into resurrection with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is promised to us. This is for us. This is the power of God dwelling in our midst. And I trust that as we enter into this new year, we long to be faithful disciples of Jesus. We long to build community and be a place that counters the lonely landscape of Los Angeles. We long to help our neighbors in need. We long to feel useful and loved and important and seen and heard. We long to feel connected to God and to grow in our faith. Going into our annual meeting today, we reflect on 2023, and we speak our hopes for 2024. So my question for us as a community today, what needs to die in the church to make way for resurrection? And can we let go of our fear of our anxiety and trust. Trust the God who makes all things new. Amen. I'm going to invite us into some time for silent meditation to reflect on these questions. Where do we need to let things die in order for new life to be reborn? 
And how can we trust in a God who makes all things new? Let us have some time for prayer and meditation.